Thank you, Alessandro, for the introduction, and thank you, Fernando, for the invitation. Actually, I didn't remember that Princeton was so close to the polar circle. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also looking forward to trying out the chalk that you have here. So I was told this was uh, the best chalk available in the world. <laughs> OK, so the setting is probably familiar to all of you. Um, we're looking at some m-dimensional closed manifold with a metric G and some target manifold, say, k-dimensional. And by Nash's embedding theorem, I may assume that n is uh, isometrically embedded in some Euclidean space Rn. And moreover, that uh, there is a neighborhood of n where there is a smooth, well-defined nearest neighbor projection, pi n, from this delta neighborhood to n. And then for smooth map, say, I can define, first of all, the Dirac uh, integral. So all maps will be C1 at least. Let's say uh, u is of class C2 from m into n. And the Dirac energy is just 1 half times the square of all components of the uh, gradient integrated over uh, our manifold M. And this should be the volume element induced by the Riemannian metric uh, G. And um, this map U is harmonic if and only if for every variation vector field phi, say again smooth, uh, C2, but now taking arbitrary values in the Amiens space Rn, the derivative in epsilon, when you uh, look at the variation of u in direction phi, this now is no longer a map to the target n, but you can produce a map by projecting. So now this is an admissible competitor. Um, and if the variation of the Dirac energy uh, at epsilon equals 0 vanishes for all such uh, phi. And of course, you can compute what this means. So this variation of directly energy this is simply well it's the <coughs> you differentiate in epsilon let me write this like this And then you integrate by parts, and you find that there is some second order differential expression in U, which we call the tension field, multiplying the variation phi, where this uh, tension field tau of U <coughs> is equal to the projection of the Laplace operator in the metric G, of course, of u to the tangent space at the point u of x. And you can compute this in terms of the second fundamental form of the target manifold. As Laplacian of u plus a of u gradient u squared. So um, this is the uh, familiar formula for the variation of Dirichlet's energy. And now um, we have uh, this uh, characterization of our harmonic map. It's a solution of this equation here um, being 0. So this variation should vanish for all uh, vector fields phi. So a harmonic map solves this expression here equal to 0. And um, well, you all know, of course, that there is the classic existence result of 
Eels and Samson. from 1965 already. If uh, the uh, target manifold is non-positively curved in the sense that the sectional curvature is non-positive, then for every map U0 from M to the target, there exists a harmonic map homotopic to U0, call it U infinity, homotopic to U0, and in fact there is a recipe for finding this harmonic map, namely U infinity is the limit as T goes to infinity suitably of the solution U to the harmonic map heat flow evaluated at time T. And the harmonic map heat flow is given by this expression. UT is simply the tangent field. So it's a nonlinear variant of the heat equation. And you start with initial data u at time t equals 0 equal u naught. So this is the famous uh, harmonic map heat flow uh, invented by Eels and Samson in 1965 in order to produce examples of harmonic maps. Let me call this maybe 1. And um, this works very well for such classes of manifolds, but um, in general um, it's not so clear uh, what uh, you can do with the harmonic map heat flow. However, there is a situation where things turn out to be nice. So if we now look at arbitrary closed targets, Then we can distinguish the case where m is equal to 2. So we're looking at flows on surfaces, Riemann closed Riemann surfaces. And in this case, actually, uh, the harmonic map heat flow has a global, unique, partially regular solution for any initial data and for any target geometry. So this is a result that I obtained in. 1985, and um, since then there have been many further results uh, improving uh, this here. For instance, Freire has shown that the solutions are unique even among the class of weak solutions whose energy is non-increasing, and this property is very important because Peter has found examples of non-unique evolutions with upwards jumps of the energy. So um, this is by now a well-developed theory, and we can kind of tick that off. Now for larger dimensions, m at least equal to 3, there is also something that can be said on the positive side. So there is a monotonicity formula and an epsilon regularity result. which I obtained in 1988. And together with uh, Yunmei Chen, using this monotonicity formula and epsilon regularity, we were able to produce global weak solutions, which were also partially regular. So this was with Yunmei Chen in 89. But after this, well, more or less uh, nice beginning, there have been many results 
trying to improve this uh, existence result for weak solutions, but most of the important questions still remain open. For instance, um, one does not know whether these solutions are unique. If they have a singularity, can you define a unique extension of the solution after the first singular time? So that's a very important uh, question that needs to be solved. Then can you refine the partial regularity results obtained? In fact, very recently, um, there was some work by um, Cheeger and others about uh, quantitative stratification, so a very fine information about the singular set, but uh, still, there are many open questions. and hardly any uh, applications or existence results coming out. So um, what could be the reason why in higher dimensions this uh, evolution problem is so badly behaved? Why is it not as well posed as in two dimensions? Of course, two dimensions is the critical dimension. In uh, two dimensions, the energy, uh, the Dirichlet energy scales um, critically. Uh, it's scaling invariant, whereas in higher dimension, it's not. But there's um, another reason, and um, this is particularly striking in the case of s uh, spheres, when the domain is the standard m-dimensional sphere. And in this case, you have uh, the action of the Möbius group on the domain. <coughs> and let me describe some consequences of this. So, for instance, um, in their work already from the 1965, Eels and Sampson observed that the identity map of the sphere to itself, when m is 3 or bigger, that this is an unstable rest point for the flow one. In fact, they notice that the infimum of the Dirichlet energy in the class of maps homotopic to U0 was zero. So this is a special instance of a result that uh, Brian White later proved in much greater generality. And um, using this fact, um, later Chen and Ding, around 1990, were able to show finite time blow up of uh, the flow one. Uh, for topological reasons, because you could start with, um, sorry, this is u bar. You could start with an initial map u0, homotopic to the identity, which had an arbitrarily small energy, so small that you could apply the epsilon zero regularity result. And um, then also using the monotonicity property, and uh, epsilon regularity of the flow, if the solution persisted <coughs> as a smooth solution for, long uh, for large times, uh, then you could show that uh, the solution was homotopically trivial after some time capital T, which is impossible when you start in the homotopy class of the identity. So um, this was uh, really a very nice result which shed light on the interaction of topological uh, properties of the map, of the initial map, 
and this monotonicity um, of the scale directly energy. Okay, so let's try to understand this a little bit uh, better now. And let's try to um, avoid the problems uh, that uh, lead to these uh, negative results. So what is the Möbius group? And uh, let's look at the special case m equal 3 just to simplify matters. And uh, there we can introduce the Möbius group as follows. So this is a picture of the three sphere. And then we have stereographic projection pi from the three sphere to R3. And then we have the inverse of stereographic projection that I call psi. And for this inverse, we have a very nice formula. Oops. Okay, and um, this uh, stereographic projection is smooth, uh, is conformal also, because you see that when you pull back the spherical metric with a psi, you get a multiple of the Euclidean metric. And from uh, this map psi, then you can uh, produce further examples of uh, conformal maps of the sphere to itself by uh, dilating in the uh, Euclidean uh, R3 down there. So let's introduce delta S. This is for S between 0 and infinity and x in R3. And then we can dilate by defining gamma s to be the composition. First, we project into R3. Then we scale. And then we project back. So this is then a map which kind of uh, lifts uh, uh, these equatorial uh, spheres or uh, spheres of equal latitude uh, closer to the poles. So, um, and we can also uh, do this not only from, from the North Pole, so this is the E4 axis in uh, R4. Uh, we can also do that from any other point on the sphere by introducing gamma AS, where R is a rotation which maps um, the point A to the uh, E4 axis. So in this way, we can um, dilate uh, from any uh, point A on the sphere that we may choose. And then uh, the Möbius group, gamma, is simply the collection of all these maps this is the Möbius group in question. Now, how does this act on uh, functions and how does it act on the Dirichlet energy? So if we have a map U, then first of all, so now here we have some target. This is our n, maybe some topology. And then we have a map u. 
from the sphere to the target in. And we can compose uh, u with psi. And we obtain a representative uh, as a map from R3 to the target manifold in. And um, if we compose u with gamma s, so with no loss of generality, I'll uh, fix a equal e4 uh, just to have a simpler notation. So if we compose u with this um, Möbius transformation gamma s, then uh, the u hat s, if you look at how uh, the gamma s is defined, um, so there is uh, the there is you should uh, let the psi act from the right and pi composed with psi is the identity. So you see that this is simply u composed with u hat composed with delta s. So it's uh, very easy to see how the Möbius group acts on these representatives of our maps. And um, the Dirichlet energy of u may be computed in terms of u hat very easily using this formula for the transformed uh, volume element. So it's just given by 1 over 1 plus norm of x squared times the standard norm of gradient squared of u hat integrated in R3. And uh, the scaled function us has a Dirichlet energy given by s divided by 1 plus s squared times norm of x squared gradient u hat dx. So the formula here is uh, very useful in as much as the dependence uh, on s appears only in this explicit factor. There is always the same map u hat, no matter which parameter s you pick. And then you just observe that when u is harmonic, then of course um, also the variation with respect to s induces a variation of this kind, which paired with a tension field of u will give 0. So um, we have that when you compute the variation of the Dirichlet energy at the point s equal 1 of us, you must have 0 by harmonicity. And on the other hand, if you call this beta of s, also depends on x, of course, but here we're interested in the s dependence. So you can perform this differentiation directly and setting s equal to 1 you get that this is 1 minus x squared divided by 1 plus x squared squared gradient u hat squared dx over r3. And on the other hand as I said, we can also compute using the formula over there and identify this with the integral of the variation of u in s against integrated against the tension field. And uh, this variation of u in s is some directional derivative of u.
where this vector field xi is uh, simply the variation of the map gamma s at s equal to 1. So we have these uh, formulae. And now maybe I go back here. And now I'll make a slight jump, but you'll soon see the connection between what I write on this board and what is written over there. I introduced the center of our map U. This is going to be the following. Call it capital X of U. And this is, so you regard S3 as the boundary of the unit ball in R4. And you have point P on S3. And then you integrate P weighted with the Dirichlet energy density. Now, as we did over here with the Dirichlet energy, we can also express this in terms of uh, our chart um, using the map psi. So p, any point p is a psi of x. And uh, the Dirichlet integral was given by this. And now if you look at the expression for psi, you see that when you look at the four component of this, when you look at the four component, <coughs> you'll find exactly this expression. So we can remark that um, I need a little bit more room. So we can remark that when u is harmonic, the four component of the center must be 0. But the E4 axis was just any axis. We can turn any axis A into the E4 direction. So the vector x of u has to vanish. So Vanishing of the center is a necessary condition for u to be harmonic. And in fact, we can also express this slightly differently. So the inner product of this four vector x of u with any vector sigma in R4, this has to be 0. And this we can compute now with the help of the tension field. This is the sum over i, sigma i, d by ds at s equal 1, of gamma ei, s multiplying our u. And um, I will call this expression <coughs> here, I will call this capital Xi of sigma, and usually abbreviate that as uh, Xi, like uh, over there. So and this is then equal to 0. So um, x 
must vanish when u is to be harmonic. And um, we could ask, um, what about uh, the, uh, the relation with uh, the Dirichlet energy? So there is now a result. So I was musing about this for a long, long time. And then uh, fortunately, we had Rick Shane visiting Zurich. And I was able to uh, talk to him and present my ideas about varying the independent variables. So looking at variations uh, of u through these um, parameterizations, gamma as of the sphere. Um, and uh, he mentioned to me work of El Sufi that was on um, surfaces of constant mean curvature, I think, and uh, did not at first relate with this. But then a little later, Tobias Lann came by. I told him what I had learned from Rick, and I told him about this project. And uh, Tobias is great at finding references. So if you ever need any reference on any topic, ask mm -hmm. Tobias. <laughs> and he found the following work of El Sufi. I think this was from 95. So there's another property. U harmonic implies that the Dirichlet energy of U, in fact, is maximal with respect to these Möbius uh, uh, transformations. So it is um, the supremum over the Dirichlet energies of the reparameterized maps when gamma varies in the Möbius group. <coughs> and equality um, is achieved, at least if u is not identically a constant, equality is achieved if and only if gamma is the identity. So, um, here's another characterization, and maybe these characterizations are related. So u harmonic implies this, and du being maximal among Möbius transformations. Well, we did not use anything but uh, varying uh, the Möbius uh, uh, map gamma uh, in making these uh, computations, du realizing the soup here implies that x of u equals 0. So can we go the other way around? Can we actually characterize uh, du being maximal in this sense with vanishing of the center? And to quote a former president, yes, we can. <laughs> Yeah, those were the days. Hmm? <laughs> yep, so let's call this soup, let's call that E of U. We've seen that this equality implies that the center must vanish. We're interested now in the converse. Now, um, so let's take a map. Uh, satisfying x of u equals 0 and set Fs equal the Dirichlet energy of u composed with gamma s. And then using the fact that um, x of u vanishes, 
So this implies, of course, that f prime of s at s equal 1 is 0, right? Using the fact uh, that x of u vanishes, we can compute f prime of s at any s. This is a computation similar to the computation that El Sufi had done, only that we do not drop all terms where the attention field appears. Um, El Sufi uh, was in interested in harmonic maps, so he just neglected all those uh, terms with the tension field. But if you keep them and just use uh, Young's inequality to estimate those terms, you'll find out that you have this estimate. Mm. And um, here I'm only looking at the range of s between 0 and 1. As an aside, maybe we can notice that we have this relation. So when s is larger than 1, we simply flip uh, the sphere around and turn uh, gamma a s into the corresponding gamma, but now um, uh, with the opposite orientation of the axis, and uh, s is turned into 1 over s. So we can always restrict to this interval from 0 to 1. And then we clearly see from this that uh, when the tension field is 0, f prime is positive, unless this vanishes is positive between 0 and 1. So you're going up to a max. And uh, this positivity will stay if uh, the tension field is not too big. So we have um, first a definition. Some uh, map u is delta 0 uniformly three-dimensional if for every x is a we have that du, the directional derivative of u in direction of the variation of gamma a s at s equal to 1. which is equal to this um, directional derivative of uh, u bar in radial direction. If this is, uni and u bar is computed with respect to the axis a, so if for every choice of A, this is at least delta 0 strictly bounded away from 0. And now, from this formula, uh, we can say that if u is delta 0 uniformly three-dimensional, with tangent field having an L2 norm strictly less than delta 0, then indeed then indeed when the center is at the origin, we have that D of U is the soup is the energy, what I defined as E of u here. 
Okay, and this proposition now is the starting point for the definition of a normalized harmonic map flow. Namely, what do we want to do? We want to maintain the condition required by El Sufi that we're always at the crest of the wave. The wave being the action of the Möbius group on our functions and uh, as an uh, as a, uh, indicator, we can now use the center. If the center is at the origin, then we have hope of staying at the crest of the wave all the time. So this is now the definition So given a smooth u0 with x of u0 equal uh, 0, we want to find solution u with an accompanying field sigma of vectors in R4 such that ut equals tau of u plus a drift in the direction of this Möbius, uh, of these Möbius transformations and satisfying the initial condition and the xi parameter is this, um, I hope it's still somewhere, maybe, ah, here it is, thank you. Yeah. So this is how the xi um, and the sigma are related. where this xi is chosen such that uh, the center does not move. Well, uh, of course, we can define lots of things. The question is whether we can find a solution Let me just remark that this again requires some smallness condition. So you may have noticed uh, that, um, that this proposition is only applicable if we're already close to our harmonic map in the sense of small tension. And um, being able to solve here requires another uh, smallness condition to hold so um, so let me write down the um, the equation here slightly differently. So this is a four vector. We can test this equation if we test with uh, some row four vector row, so we look at this. And we differentiate in time, and then for any test vector row, this has to vanish. But now remember what uh, x is, how it was defined. So this comes from the, first of all, the variation of the Dirichlet energy in direction of the uh, xi field induced by rho, which I now call eta.
so it's this. And when you now differentiate, you get two terms because the u appears twice. So you get the second variation. And uh, we can insert the equation uh, for ut. So now let's call this 2. So if we use 2, then this is equal to tau u plus psi dot du. And uh, this guy here we can again write as tau of u multiplied with eta dot d and this is another tau of u plus psi du. Now, if the tension is small, then the contribution from this guy is small. Uh, the contribution from this guy is small. So basically, what you want to do is you want to solve um, d squared du psi du eta du equals something. And um, now I call uh, u Möbius non-degenerate. If the map Q of sigma and rho defined by d squared du psi dot du eta dot du, if this is non-degenerate. So psi is this. And then one can show One can show that if u0 with x of u0 equals 0 is delta 0 uniformly three-dimensional and Möbius non-degenerate, with a tension field that is sufficiently small. So here we require this condition to have our characterization of being on the crest of the wave. And then uh, with this Möbius non-degeneracy, in order to be able to solve this, we need another smallness condition So there, in this case, there exists some positive time t and a unique solution u sigma of 2 with u equal u0. And the proof is just by a standard fixed point argument. Now, this solution has most of the nice properties of the standard heat flow. For instance, it satisfies the energy identity so as we evolve in time the energy decreases 
because when we insert the equation for ut, we have this is minus the tension squared. And then there is a term which may look intractable at first, but then you see, you look here, x of u equals 0 implies orthogonality <coughs> of these two terms, so this simply is 0. So you're strictly decreasing the energy unless you have a harmonic map. So that's very nice. Then as a second result, you have, now you look at the um, problematic situation dealt with by Eels and Samson, the identity map u bar equal identity. This is now nonlinearly non stable under the flow 2. And in fact, uh, this well potence result continues to hold if you <laughs> perturb the geometry. So um, if you're looking at a target manifold N, which is diffeomorphic to S3 via some map phi, then uh, also for maps from S3 to N, which, are, uh, which have the property that uh, U0 composed with phi is sufficiently close to the identity, the flow will be well behaved and converge as t goes to infinity to our harmonic map. just uh, to write down some keywords. But um, of course, there is the smallness condition all around. And in the remaining seven or so minutes, uh, I want to tell you some ideas how you can uh, extend uh, this notion and uh, also deal with large data. However, this is really um, only a sketch. I don't have any concrete result. I think this is uh, a research topic. So let me maybe start here. First of all, an example. So Smith, in 75, analyzed the situation of maps from the sphere to a long ellipsoid. So if this axis had a length b, and uh, you observe that there is a number b star such that for b larger than b star, there is no co-rotational harmonic map. I guess you all know what co-rotational harmonic maps are. Um, and that means that the corresponding heat flow in this situation has to blow up either in finite or infinite time. But with this symmetry of co-rotational uh, maps, the harmonic map heat flow, the standard eel samson flow, already has the property that the center is at the origin. So the uh, harmonic map heat flow and the normalized flow are the same. <coughs> so you get blow up for harmonic map, harmonic map flow and normalized. As well. So both flows have to blow up. However, 
maybe you can use the normalized flow. Maybe you can use the normalized flow to analyze the singularity that develops. Maybe in this setting, if you look at the behavior of the energy under under Möbius transformations, maybe the uh, behavior looks like this. Here at s equal 1, you have a critical point of this height function. By symmetry, x of u has to vanish, so that's cor that corresponds to this. But maybe the maximum is somewhere else. And then it might be advantageous to discontinuously jump from u to some u dot gamma, and then continue the evolution now of the normalized flow from that. And then the question is, can you de uh, develop, can you conceive a notion of weak solution for the normalized flow which allows for such jumps? And then characterize uh, the behavior uh, of this weak solution, maybe also um, uh, prove uniqueness and so on. And another thing that I wanted to mention is uh, the relation um, of uh, now the hum normalized harmonic map flow with topology. In the beginning, I told you that uh, the um, Dirichlet energy cannot detect topology because there are examples where when you compose with Möbius transformations, uh, the Dirichlet energy can be made arbitrarily small. However, the energy cannot. The energy detects topology. And uh, just over here, maybe. The reason is that the energy controls the, the uh, Mori norm. So um, remember that dUs started like <coughs> this here. And uh, therefore, S this can be bounded by the energy. And this is one of the terms that you need to control for the Mori norm. So we have control of the Mori norm of the of uh, solution, and um, then using regularization and um, uh, the fact that uh, we have this control, one can actually, for a suitable class of uh, maps very close to this, uh, the one uh, defined by this inequality one can define homotopy type. And then the next question is, does this weak solution preserve homotopy type? And then maybe lead to existence results. So there's a lot of work for you to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>